Hello and welcome to Canaman TV. My name is Conor McLeod and in this exclusive interview, I get the chance to speak with the Managing Director of the British Hemp Alliance, Rebecca Shaman. Rebecca has recently published the UK Hemp Manifesto, an all-inclusive guide to the key factors relating to the UK hemp industry and the necessary requirements needed in order to achieve a much more proficient and thriving UK hemp industry in the near future. So, make sure and like and subscribe and stick around until the end. See them myself on the end of episode cartoon. Now then, let's talk cannabis. Um, in fact, just before we cover it, the instigation behind doing this manifesto, what was your what was your motivation? Is it because of the UN conve single convention is getting addressed in December, so you thought the time is now? I think there's a number of things. Um, it, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of um, information that um, is very scattered. So I really felt it was important to draw the argument together into one document right. that could clearly be disseminated and um, used at various times to look at the benefits of agricultural um, hemp. Right. And we were approached by a political lobbyist that wanted to take the argument to government, um, to various um, MPs, and there wasn't anywhere where he could actually present them a document that really just clearly laid out the argument. And the IHA brought out a manifesto in June and it made me realize that we are no longer in the EU so actually mm. Britain needed its own manifesto uh, and to start promoting hemp um, for, um, for the UK um, seeming as that we're now out of Brexit it's important that the UK recognizes the benefits of hemp um, outside of the uh, European Union. Right. So bringing all of those arguments together solely as a argument for UK um, and British hemp industry uh, felt an important step forward in order to move the agenda forward. Yeah, well, you've certainly done that because after looking over the thing, I mean, you've hit absolutely every nail on the head when it comes to the hemp argument, you know, agricultural, environmental, the basis of diet, uh, the innovation um, towards agriculture itself. Foods, absolutely everything has been covered. So tremendous job, Rebecca, honestly. Well done. Thank you. Thanks so much, Connor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've done a fantastic job. And what's good about this is when I'm editing over, I'll edit and, and I'll play every single thing we're talking about here on the screen so the, the viewers can watch this as well. And they can be right. what we're referring to. So to start off, you've I you actually referred to it as the elephant in the room about the, um, dissecting hemp as part of the cannabis sativa plant. Could you give the viewers obviously a brief background on why that's been a difficulty in the past? Well, um, because THC is a controlled substance and considered a controlled substance, hemp has kind of been um, sucked into that maelstrom, even though it has a very minimal amount of THC, so it's not psychoactive uh, THC. And because of that, the leaves and the flower of the hemp plant are considered a controlled substance. But things are getting um, much harder um, with, for the industry as we move more into a CBD awareness and the awareness of the uh, flower and the leaf. And so what we're really wanting to show is that there's a difference between the medicinal part of the cannabis plant and the industrial agricultural part of the, the cannabis plant, because while it's all under one, um, under one uh, controlled substance, there's yeah. no um, possibilities to, for it to be recognized as an agricultural crop. Yeah. And so um, we feel it's very important to, um, to show the difference between the agricultural industrial part of the hemp plant or the cannabis plant yeah. um, compared to the, the obviously what's considered the medicinal part of the, the hemp plant. And the UN Convention is obviously has been a big part of that confusion. Mm -hmm. And they have a vote in December as to whether to deschedule hemp completely from the UN Convention um, of 1961, which would mean that we would then be in a, a very different uh, situation where we could start utilizing hemp as an agricultural crop. However, this vote has been delayed for the last two years right. and could very well be delayed again. And this is because of the political, um, in it, the political interests that surround this plant and the vested interests that surround this plant that are still very much embedded in the history of the, of the cannabis plant. It's certainly been forgotten about the industrial aspect of cannabis. I mean, the entire channel so far has been focused on medicinal, as you just mentioned, and there's been a small little section in the past couple of interviews where I've touched on recreational, but the reality is, I felt very much out my depth looking over your, your work here, Rebecca, because it just shows you how absent-minded, and the thing is as well, it's so, it's almost like this should be the priority. When you read over what you've written here, and which is completely accurate and factually based, the reality that humans 
as a as a species have omitted this from agriculture itself as as a crime against humanity and the earth. I mean, that's as, as the as the viewers will see very clearly. So a few of the the, the main points as you've done in the introduction here is removing hemp as a controlled substance from the misuse of drug act, as you've just mentioned, 1971. Removing all uh, home office licensing restrictions and put into DEFRA's jurisdiction. I never looked over what is DEFRA. A Department for Environment, Farming and Agriculture. Okay. So it used to be the Ministry of um, Agriculture, Farming and Fisheries, but they changed it to DEFRA, which is the Department for Agriculture, Farming and, um, and Food. Right, excellent. So and it's increased uh, the permitted levels of THC to 1%, um, reflecting what's Switzerland, which I'm aware that they've had it at 1% for a while now, yeah? Yeah, and, and, and actually there's, um, I think the Czech Republic is also looking to um, lift it to 1%. Uh, uh, it's very interesting, these THC levels, because when I was growing hemp in 2007 and 2008, in England it was 0.3% THC, right. and they changed it to 0.2% THC, I think it was in 2010 or 2011. Right. And the problem is, is that the the plant naturally produces THC as a UV sunlight protector. So it's a sunlight plant in, in that it needs the sunlight to grow. And therefore, like in the Northern Hemisphere, you get one crop a year in the summertime. Right. And in order to protect the plant from those UV sunlight rays, it produces THC. So the more sunlight there is, the more THC it naturally produces. And the healthier the plant is, so to try and keep it at 0.2% THC or 0.3% THC is, it makes, is very difficult for nature, especially as we've got um, global warming or that there's a heating up um, yeah. of the sun. There's definitely hotter, sun, hotter um, summers coming now and everything's much hotter. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is, is that by trying to maintain the levels at 0.2% THC, we're not getting healthy plants. Right. And we're not getting diversity of species and we're not getting diversity of, um, of seed varieties. And so by putting up to 1% and ideally higher, uh, it gives us a more opportunity to have diversity of seed, a healthier crop, and we're able to do much more with that crop. Right. It, it, um, THC, before it gets psychoactive, really needs to be around 7% for it to start having a, 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 an effect on the body. So 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 1% really it doesn't make any difference. No, 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 no. It doesn't make any difference. Again, it, it's just crippling the industry, these, these regulations, and, and, and they don't really serve anybody, and they're not, they don't really make a difference. Um, from 0.2%, 0.3% to 1%. It seems extremely minimal. What was the even point in, at the beginning of changing it from 0.3 to 0.2? I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. But it makes it much difficult, much harder for the industry to, um, to grow seed. For example, and in America, it's 0.3%. So they, they're able to cultivate their, their, their hemp crops to 0.1% more THC, but we can't grow those seeds because ours is 0.2 percent so we can't get access to european um to american seeds so it's very limited to the seeds that we can get and so there can't be any diversity the genetics and all the other things that we could be doing um like any crop yeah. um we're so we're, we're limited it's, it's, it's crippling that the, the thc levels yeah um so then you've also wrote at the side uh Deschedule all derivatives, extracts, cannabinoids, and seeds of the whole um, hemp plant. Funnily enough, when I was reading this, I was like, oh, that should be interesting derivatives. And then you perfectly wrote at the end, as long as these portions of the plant remain below the THC threshold, which I thought was quite humorous, because obviously that it completely undermines everything if it didn't, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's like um, the recognition of hemp as a beneficial driver for rural economic innovation, that in itself would be tremendous, because the reality is if hemp was to arrive, which I sincerely hope it does as the main, as the main agricultural crop basis, there will be a baseline in the UK that then we're going to be able to just move in almost any direction because of the basis of having this in the, in, in the, in the first place is that correct yes that's right yeah exactly so then we've got a uh, record you've wrote uh, recognize and promote hemp as a viable and essential uk environmental crop and recognize the cultivation of hemp as having an important net carbon positive impact and therefore a public service to the public good that in itself as you mentioned later on um, in your manifesto considering the the current uh, carbon footprint and the goal to remove um a, a net zero for carbon for 2030 i think you wrote um that in itself is like as you mentioned when it comes to uh, sequestration and uh, it was a fight remediation two words that i had to study to figure out what they meant in the first place <laughs> <laughs> no but uh, but yeah so i mean and then you wrote at the bottom here is with an introduction um the green jobs plan which was uh, promoted by the chancellor rishi sunak 
um, until 2020, which would be, it's almost um, almost a pun, the fact that it's green jobs, you know. Um, but that in itself would be a, like a tremendous boost. Um, so the introduction itself is it's just, it's, you've laid out absolutely everything here, Rebecca. Um, the history of hemp itself as well, a lot of people won't be aware, um, is that it was illegal not to grow hemp. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Under Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, um, you had to grow a certain amount of your land, had to be um, grown with hemp. And that was because as um, Britain started to discover and explore other um, countries, then it was, the hemp, it was the hemp plant that was able to build the navy. And also, interestingly, it um, built uh, the navy that was able to protect England from, you know, Spain, France, mm. uh, Netherlands from from attack. And so yeah. it was it was considered an incredibly important uh, plant at that time. And uh, it was so it was so important that you could even pay your taxes with it. Yeah. So um, people would yeah would barter their taxes <laughs> with the hemp so with, hemp, used, with hemp fiber. Is that really used as a form of currency? Yeah, it was used as a as a, as a way of um, yeah form of commerce because it, it it was such an essential part of the navy. Can first comes from the word cannabis right. because it's the only seafaring fabric doesn't dissolve in seawater. It was used um, as um, insulation around the boats and um, obviously for all the ropes. And obviously, you know, when they were going out and into onto the seas for three or four months, then. Then, then it was an incredibly hardy fabric for them um, to to be able to to be able to sail over the, the oceans and, yeah. and discover other countries. And it was part it was part of the exploration of the British Empire. So yeah, we could be calling it the British Empire. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good. I like that. That's brilliant. A lot of people will be wondering as well. So how could it go from such a polarized position then? If it went from such a predominant important crop in the UK, what happened for it to go to such a, a, a demonized substance? Well, it, that was a long time ago. It was 14, we were talking about 16th, 17th century. And, but hemp's always been in our diet. And it was just considered a crop like anything else, like wheat, like barley, <laughs> like oats. It, there was never controversy over hemp. Um, and it was used prolifically. It was in the medicinal cornucopia. Uh, it, it's very well documented that uh, Queen Victoria used it ex extensively and it was used medicinally with no problems but in 1937 the, the problem the problem was was the the way it was uh, harvested and and decorticated so it, it it took a lot of uh, slave labor right so a lot of the black slaves you see them in the cotton fields and stuff but actually they also worked in the hemp fields right. because you had to cut the hemp down and then you had to rest it in the field for six weeks and then you had to separate the hemp from the fiber, the, the plant from the fiber, and, and it was very labor intensive. And in 1936, uh, Schlichten, um, who was an inventor, brought out a decorticator, which meant that you could put the fiber in, in gre as green and it would come out and it would separate the fibers and, and come out the other end, right. which completely transformed the could potentially have the potential to transform the whole hemp industry because once you had this machine, then you could turn it into fiber, then, you know, the, the, then, and, and it, and it reduced the amount of, of labor that was, that was needed. Then the profit margins were obviously higher and, and, and then you could really move forward in lots of different areas. And in 1937, uh, popular mechanics, which was a very important uh, magazine, uh, wrote an article called Hemp, the Billion Dollar Crop. And it, this was, like, was in 1937. So you can imagine that the, the potential of it was, was enormous. Yeah. And at the same time, um, a lot of the vested interests that were politically connected to the government uh, started to put pressure on the government to stop this industry from flourishing. And we're talking about the cotton industry, the paper industry, and, and, and more importantly, the fossil fuel industry or the petrochemical industries that saw, and the steel industries that suddenly saw this, this hemp crop that could now, you could have fiber at any, any length, any width, any, any strength, suddenly consuming these these uh, other industries and um, due to a lot of political intrigue and connections a marijuana tax act, a tax act was brought out in America in 1937 basically banning anyone who was growing marijuana and unfortunately because people didn't know what marijuana was they just 
the whole hemp industry was caught up in that maelstrom and the whole cannabis industry was caught up in that maelstrom. And what happened was um, we, very quickly the industry with that tax act um, was decimated. But in 1942, um, after the, um, during the Second World War, there was a Hemp for Victory campaign in America to reignite the hemp industry in order to help fund the war effort. And so there was a big push for hemp, which we saw. Yeah. And then unfortunately, as soon as that finished, then we got the political um, pressure came back again. And then in the 1950s, there was a lot of liberation of cannabis and, and a lot of people smoking cannabis and there was a big cannabis revolution. And then in 1961, the UN convention, um, drugs convention, um, a scheduled cannabis as a class one scheduled drug and underneath that hemp was automatically included and then obviously in the 1970 in the UK the misuse of drugs act 1971 took that UN convention and, 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 and just com continued with it so since 1971 in the UK um, it became illegal completely to grow or, or work with hemp or work with cannabis so really since the 1960s there's been a massive disconnect between the plant and humanity right right um this is dynamite rebecca i must say i'm no joking this is going to be one of the most informative interviews ever this is excellent <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah i mean essentially then so you've got that you've got the, you've just mentioned um extremely articulately there about the un single conventions act um, you then describe in great detail um, the difference between industrial hemp and cannabis, the, the recreational substance. You also outline really well the, the, the benefits of the seed itself, which has got um, the ability to replace fossil fuels, including biofuels, biodegradable plastics. It's also um, usable for solvents and paints. Um, in addition, the seed's extremely nutritious with um, omega-3, 6, and 9, gamma linoleic, uh, if that's correct, linoleic acid. Yeah. Um, as well as all the essential amino acids um, for an, an essential balanced diet, plus uh, skin creams and beauty products, which is at this moment in time in season, you know, certainly in season. Um, and, and obviously the flowers are essential for human health. Um, one of the things that I found frustrating actually with our first conversation a few months back was that I was unaware of that, that, that hemp can be grown in the UK, but it's the flower and the leaves because you can't take all your product over here. I, like There's like 90% of your plant that's gone elsewhere. So that's the economy's at a deficit just by the basis of this legislation. No, well, it's crazy because basically we can't harvest the leaf and the flower. So you have to leave it to rest on the ground. Um, and, and obviously it's so crazy that you could outsource a farm in Lithuania because in Lithuania they allow <laughs> the farmers to <laughs> harvest and process the CBD, but we're not allowed to. But then you can ship it over to England and stick it on the shelves and have people consume it. Yeah. So it really seems to be a mad disconnect that you can consume CBD very legally and, and, and openly, but our farmers can't actually have access to the profitability. Yeah. And at the moment, it's been estimated that it's about 300 million pounds a year that farmers could be benefiting from this industry. But because of this legislation, they're not able to access that, that profitability. And in a time when rural economies are really collapsing and the farming community is desperately looking to diversify into different crops, yeah. that the government is still holding this rhetoric that hemp is a dangerous, um, uh, dangerous narcotic. And yeah. we all know, and the history is very clear, that actually it's an essential crop for environmental health and well-being and also for human health and well-being. Yeah, I mean, it actually puts the, it shines a light on it when you think about it that way. 380 million a year, and if you go back to even just the 60s, what is that? You're, you're looking at that almost hundreds of billions that have been lost just to be the basis of this yeah. extremely ignorant legislation. Um, so you, you wrote down again, it's like the industrial benefits of agriculture when using hemp, um, the alternative to oilseed rape, which has obviously got um, extremely damaging elements such as flea beetle damage, and um, also it's extremely detrimental to the soil in which it's grown. Um, agronomically, it's, it's, um, UK hemp is obviously native oilseed. Um, it requires almost zero... Um, uh, pesticides and all these different things that are used normally with other industrial crops no associated risks effective break crop which was an extremely thing that i was like extremely impressed with the fact that this is the case that it's like international studies have shown that the cultivation of soil is left in optimum condition and can deliver a 15 20 percent higher yield with follow-on crop yield so after so people that are unaware of that when you use hemp in your as your break crop the soil that's left is in a better condition than it was before is that correct yeah, and, and actually we're seeing 20 to 30% better yields of the follow-on crop. Yeah. So if you grow it, if you go winter wheat, for example, after you've grown hemp in the summer, you're going to see a better yield of, of that 
crop because it puts so much goodness in this, um, into the soil and sucks out so many contaminants. Yeah. So it does really, and it, and it helps compacted soil. It aerates compacted soil and it, it brings a lot of movement to the soil. So um, worm, worm activities and, and kind of bug activities that the, uh, that the soil really needs to be healthy. And also wildlife love hemp. So you get a lot of wildlife activity around a hemp um, around a hemp uh, 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 farm or around a hemp field. And it really benefits like bees and, uh, and other insects that are essential for the um, ecosystem to be flourishing. Yeah, see these wildlife, they know more than us, apparently. <laughs> Every animal loves hemp. I mean, horses love hemp, cat, dogs and cats love hemp. I mean, animals do love hemp. Hemp is our symbiotic um, best friend in the plant world. And it is a necessity for human health and well-being. And I, I find it very interesting that since the ban on hemp, we've seen a massive decline in our environmental and human health and well-being. Yeah. And don't want to put it onto one plant, but certainly it has an aspect. Also, obviously, there's been a big ignorance within the medical um, community on our endocannabinoid system, where yeah. we have an endocannabinoid system that directly boosts our immune system and our brain uh, function. And, and actually, in the last... 70 years or you know eat no in a while in more than that yeah. since since the ban on hemp we've seen a massive rise in degenerative brain diseases like yeah. alzheimer's and parkinson's and dementia and we're not feeding our brains and the endocannabinoid system does directly that feed our brains so not having access to endocannabinoids um, from the whole plant is really a crime against um, human health and well-being yeah. so it is really essential that we are consuming as much cbd as possible in order to keep ourselves healthy and well yeah. There's an extremely strong correlation. Many people, obviously, skeptics mostly will be like, oh, that's just a correlation. It doesn't causations absent that. But the reality is, I've thought the same thing. It's like it's quite, inter you know, quite interesting that in this last 70, 80, 90 years, we have seen a huge rise in neurodegenerative conditions at the same time as we've seen a huge decline in this extremely essential dietary supplement. I mean, all, all the people used to grow it because it's so cheap. It's a cheap plant. It's a weed. It acclimatizes to to the soil and to the climate after three generations. So you can, you can, it's, it's very easily adaptable like humans yeah. and they used to feed it to their animals. So, and then we would eat the animals. So we were consuming cannabis or hemp in, in so many different ways. It was, it was prolifically in our diet. It was prolifically in our world and to have it completely um, taken away. I think it has had a, I, I think that it has had a, a huge effect. Um, um, but we can't, yeah, we would, ne would never be able to prove that, but yeah. it does seem, it does seem a weird correlation for sure. It's hemp's impact on soil in particular, as you've wrote here, um, hemp with a deep tap root can break up compaction, aerate the soil and further aid in nutrition and uh, nutrient absorption and uptake plants season over season, remediating over fertilization, soil erosion and compaction. So the top soil element is obviously key when it comes to the follow on crops um, not only that for wildlife, things like this. Um, carbon sequestration, is that how we pronounce that? Sequestration? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. CO2 sequestration ranges between 10 and 15 tonnes of atmospheric carbon per hectare in a three months period. I was completely unaware of, of what that word is and is, can barely pronounce the thing, bloody word. But it says essentially, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is that essentially it removes carbon from the atmosphere and puts it into solid and liquid form to then be disposed of? So with carbon sequestration, so because it grows, it's a summer plant and it grows um, in three months up to five metres, it's sucking out massive amounts of carbon out of the atmosphere, obviously taking it into the soil, so it locks it into the soil, but also you then turn that that carbon into a closed cycle like clothing or whatever you want to turn yeah. it into, into a product. Mm -hmm. So you've got a closed cycle loop, right. but it's the fastest growing plant and it, they've worked out it's between 10 to 15 tons of carbon per hectare. Um, so it, 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 is a, it is a brilliant carbon sequester. It also is much more, um, it's much more efficient than trees uh, because it's sucking it out within, the net for, in, within three months, but then you're turning that into sustainable products. And it's also um, coming straight into the soil, so you're using the carbon in the soil as well. So actually, it's a really um, important plant. And then also acre for acre, hemp is more effective to make paper than trees as well. So we should, we, we, we need to be looking at hemp as a, as a viable carbon offset.
mm. uh, and not just as um, and not just looking at trees because obviously trees has its ha, have their own limitations in regards to proper carbon sequestration. Yeah, and also I don't want to get into the argument of trees versus no, no. hemp, but there's it's a big <laughs> argument. Yeah. Um, between how how hemp is a lot more efficient to trees than to sequestering carbon offsetting. It certainly seems evident. I mean, there's the, I'm aware, obviously, like you just mentioned, there's most likely a debate when trees to har- uh, and when it comes to hemp and trees. But the basis of having to grow like you know decades for trees, and then you've got hemp as you just mentioned, there's an extremely quick turnaround. You've got this extremely circular situation towards the economy. All these different other products that can be produced relatively quickly in comparison to trees to root and and, and to produce their, what's required for them. Exactly. And then also it depends what species of trees you're growing. If you're growing a fast growing tree, it might be sucking up nutrients in the ground or it might be taking up space on the land. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, debate over, you know, tree sequestration and, and actually hemp just by its very nature hmm. is, a, is, a, is a natural carbon sequester. Well, fingers crossed. Once, and I think more efficient. Once hemp's established, I think this won't be even a debate. I think um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the proven contribution to the public good, obviously, being for individuals that are uh, pro climate change and obviously want to see more of an impact and in, in, um, industry being removing uh, their negative impact towards climate change, has been proven, as you mentioned, a net carbon positive impact. It provides new renewable, biodegradable, low impact materials for thousands of different uses and is a, f- a feasible solution to petrochemical products, which um, which is something that was this mentioned in the Paris was it the Paris uh, climate summit that was in 2016 was it so the par- the the Paris climate agreement um, asked governments to reduce their carbon to net zero by 2030 and actually the British government was one of five of countries to agree to that climate agreement and actually signed it into climate law with the climate um, the climate act I think it's called right. which means that something like a certain amount of percentage has of of um, petrochemicals have to be biofuels. That we have to we have to reach carbon net zero by 2030. And actually, this government isn't really doing anything in 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 real terms to reach those targets. And if they were really serious about their climate change obligations, they would be using hemp as part of their solutions. Yeah. As you mentioned earlier as well, the, the basis the benefit for farmers in general, there has been a decline in UK farming um, species. I think it was like 40% of species that are able to be used has been declined, I think, wildlife in particular. Um, the current age is something I was unaware of as well. The current age of a, a farmer is 59 years old, I think you wrote here. And obviously yeah, it, would, yeah. um, it would bring in a younger generation. I think. Do you think that would be largely because it's connected to cannabis, the hemp plant itself? Or do you think, what do you think the reason would be it would bring in younger farmers? I think there's naturally a move towards the next generation of farmers are coming in, um, the children of the farmers. And there's a, there's a, 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 the shift of consciousness. I mean, all those farmers who in their 60s grew up with the whole kind of controversial um, yeah. narrative around cannabis. So, and and it, it, it's cannabis, the current cannabis nar- narrative has only really changed in the last 10 years. Prior to that, um, there was it, there wasn't any real kind of understanding support or um, um, uh, farming understanding of hemp, yeah. but we're seeing a massive shift in the last five um, five ten years. Certainly with the rise of the CBD industry, I would think that that's really that's what's really ignited the hemp industry. Anyone that was previously working with hemp wasn't doing it for a massive financial benefit they were doing it because you know they they had a love for the plant and they saw the Mm. benefits of it but with the rise of cbd industry we're seeing a massive interest in the rise of hemp but it was really when america brought out the farm bill in 2018 which enabled hemp to be grown legally in in usa that we've seen a huge um, increase in, in, in the understanding and, and the processing and harvesting and, 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 and the whole industry around hemp. And one of the reasons for the hemp manifesto is we're seeing a huge roll, roll out of, of restrictions or um, roll back of restrictions all over, the, all over the world, except in England. So in England, I think we're the only country left in, in the world that still has it under a home office license. Yeah. 
um, that the that the limitations of actually growing it it's never really been accepted as a crop here in the UK even though obviously we've got the history behind it and 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 so we're very behind uh, countries like well like Europe like certain European countries certain Eastern European countries and now of course America Canada so if we don't get on the hemp boat now and remove those barriers to growth in five years down the line we would just be consumers of hemp products that be imported and we won't have an opportunity to be part of a wider hemp industry and 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 and, and actually set up i would say certain products within the uk that we could really excel at and export out um to other countries uh, if we were able to re remove all those barriers to growth it would enable the industry to really um flourish and have the opportunity to experiment and see what we could do here in the uk and because we're so small as we're a small island yeah. i would say two or three um if we could if we could produce three or two or three really great products that we could then export we could be um we could really bring in that innovation technology and the high um manufacturing um that we've always had and, and the reputation that we've always had we could really now move it towards hemp and and another thing that i'd like to mention is that there's a lot of decimated uh towns now certainly in the north in the northern power mm -hmm. um powerhouse and also down in the southwest and we're really seeing a Brexit, you know, coronavirus landscape that mm -hmm. is creating a lot of uncertainty for a lot of people. So this is a very, um, it's a very powerful opportunity to see whether we could reignite a manufacturing industry, a, you know, traditional manufacturing industry, which yeah. England has always been um, around, around hemp and actually see if we can rejuvenate some of these um, decimated areas of England and, and um, the rest of the UK. Yeah, there's certainly a, a, a very desperate urgency behind it when you look at that. I think you wrote that there's at the moment, um, <coughs> excuse me, they have a, what's called hemp cultivation is going exponentially throughout Europe. 33,000 hectares in 2016 in Europe alone, 56,000 hectares in Canada, 46,000 in China. Um, and then you come to the UK and we have 850. That's almost an embarrassment. <laughs> You know, it really isn't. Yeah. It really isn't. I know. Um, <laughs> and you've perfectly outlined uh, a lot of the problems here, because even though we're talking about this at the moment in time, um, there are people can grow hemp, but as we mentioned, you can only process barely eighty percent of the product, really, because you've got the leaf and the and the flower has to be destroyed. You've also got for individuals that are willing to kind of sacrifice their time and just um, process the seed in the stock. Um, the complicated process, as you've mentioned here, hemp requires a renewable three-year home office license, which is constantly changing, extremely complicated to fill out, and disincentivizes. Um, farmers, the license time frame is often awarded at a time where it's out of season as well, which is uh, just extremely detrimental to anybody that wants to actually have a, a proficient year. Um, you know, when it comes yeah. to growing a product in the first place, um, the DBS check. What is a DBS check? Um, a data. It's one of those um, a data. data like, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's um, it's like when you go um, to make sure that you haven't got a prison record. Right. It's yeah. a security check. Right. Okay. Um, you but that. it's a very high level security check. So people who do DBS checks are usually, you know, police, police, um, policemen and women, yeah. or prison men and women, or anywhere where you're put into a, a a situation where you know there's a home office situation. You'd need a DBS check to make sure that you're legitimate, that you're, um, well, you don't have any previous convictions and yeah. all that kind of stuff yeah. so just a, but for an uh, agricultural crop it's not you know buy it. it's not re it's not relevant essentially because um, it's, it's most far for all farmers <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> them to do a a you know a, an advanced dbs check because they want to grow agricultural hemp to yeah. you know turn into a product yeah. again it's a distance it's a disincentivizes the farmers or yeah. why would they why would they go there and they have to pay for the privilege of that and they have to pay for the privilege of getting the license which is 580 pounds yeah. and if the home office wants to do a a check on your a, a check on your a compliance check on your land you have to pay the 1500 pounds that it's going to cost them to do yeah. that compliance check so really there's just so much yeah. and then you might get your license in april and you need to grow it in the end of april so you don't have time to get the seed and we don't have a british seed yeah. because obviously there's no inve no investment no funding no support agriculturally so all our seed has to come from abroad you have to pay vat on that seed so uh, it, it, on and on and on it goes there is just we can't kickstart an industry that is just so crippled yeah 
Yeah, I mean, that's uh, the, the, the reality when you vote your drugs and firearms department. You think to yourself, it's like, would they be doing this for carrots? You know, it's like just showing up. It's like, let's check this. This demands a criminal. Well, they were for doing carrots. it for, for oil, oil, oil seed rape. Yeah. I mean, would they do it for oil seed rape? No, exactly. of course they wouldn't. Exactly. You know, and, and, and they want to push the pulses and, and, and push farmers into pulses and legumes and stuff when actually they could be really moving into hemp. Yeah. And, also, and, and, also, and also getting. Uh, and an opportunity to actually have some kind of lucrative uh, benefits from from the hemp, from the leaf and the flower, if we were able to uh, harvest and process that and extract. Yeah, and as you've mentioned before, is there's no way you're going to boost the entire UK economy through lagoons and and like these kind of things. It's just not going to be the case. It's like the hemp is just not really. <laughs> hemp is unparalleled. I mean, that's the reality. It's an unparalleled. Unparalleled. It completely is. Um, you mentioned earlier as well, it was a rare 2018, the US Farm Bill, which pushed through economic benefits in the, U in, in the US. Um, a rare moment of clarity for uh, the Trump administration, I would add. Um, it's obviously had theories like the, the, hemp, uh, the US hemp industry has grown 27% annually. It's looking at um, 820 million in 2017, projected to rise to 2.6 billion in US domestic sales revenue by 2022, only two years away. So already the UK is missing out on hundreds of millions, if not billions of pounds, just by this delayed strategy essentially this delayed situation of um, poor legislation no understanding of the product and essentially it seems like there's no real incentive apart from yourselves other than organizations that you um, that are also very similar to yourself with the same dynamic of this is went on too long apart from which would seem relatively um revolutionary these these um these individuals like, such as yourself and um, i think the scottish hemp association which is hopefully becoming um public in the next few months are doing the same thing it's like this has went on long enough you know we shouldn't be dealing with this it shouldn't this should be politicians that are prioritizing this because it's going to benefit the economy it's going to benefit the environment people's health but it just seems to be that it's almost as if it's a hot potato they don't want to touch mm -hmm. i know exactly and, it, and they don't want to touch because it's so politically motivated and yeah. it's a it's a poison chalice but you know about three years ago someone told me oh don't bother you'll never come out of the home office it's it's a poison chalice but i feel now more than ever this is the time to push because of the situation we're in yeah. in 2020 uh when we really are in a desperate economic and environmental you know crisis yeah. <laughs> and, and and a human health crisis as well yeah that we've not really seen in our lifetime this is again this is a situation if there's not a unprecedented 100 percent. and if this is not the time to apply a plant that not only boosts the economy it boosts people's health i have no idea what time is correct for it you know no this <laughs> is it um this is the time without a doubt without a doubt um and i really hope that come december time as well that that will i hope it doesn't get pushed forward again or pushed back and um, i really hope that that's that's going to be a real a positive change because that will incorporate not just the uk but also the other countries which have agreed to the un single convention and um, which will boost just an overall global approach i really hope by this time next year we have a a, a much more acceptable global approach towards cannabis in itself you know recreationally medicinally and through the hemp industry um so the the, the potential of hemp to shape rural economies is if you've already mentioned um, encourages micro businesses, SMEs that have the potential to support and shape the local and specifically rural economies, which have been decimated, as you've mentioned, um, through not only the corona but just the lack of industry in general. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's everything's outlined here, eh, Rebecca. This is just it's, it's brilliant. So social innovation um, as a crop with multiple end product uses. I mean, a lot of people when I mentioned hemp itself, they're like, you have no idea how many things you can use with hemp. Legitimately, they say twenty thousand because it's a big number. It could well surpass that, you know. Well, yes. I mean, if you use every part of the hemp plant, I, I, I was even told that the root of the hemp plant was made for gunpowder. Oh, is that right? Which is interesting. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's thousands of use. Anything that's made from petrochemicals can be made from hemp. Um, and obviously anything that's made from wood can be made from hemp. And all textiles can be made from hemp. Fabric can be made from hemp. So the first uh, fabric that was found was, I think, um, one of the oldest hemp fabrics that was found was a hemp silk kimono from japan All right. and uh and, and obviously they used to everything you know they used to draw on on hemp um leonardo da, Va leonardo da vinci um drew on hemp canvas and his paints were um oil-based hemp paints so yeah there, there's thousands of uh different applications i mean henry ford and Rudolf Diesel were both hemp farmers, and so the hemp Ford T, the T Ford, the first car was built from, you know, uh, hemp, and the diesel engine was designed to run on biodiesel using hemp and peanut oil. Right. 
and and the first four presidents of the United States were all hemp farmers. So it was a it was a very important, very lucrative, very profitable crop, and very important for both in historical terms for both for all over Europe and and the United uh, Kingdom and, and the United States of America and, the, and Northern America. Um, but also in, in, in Asia as well, it was a, a really important plan. And really the United Nations Convention, 1961 Convention on Drugs, um, decimated the, 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 the global industry of hemp. And now we're seeing slowly this renaissance, yeah. but it's very important that it's done in a way where everyone benefits and not just big organizations or big companies that are in bed with the government. And that's one thing that for me is really important that this is a, a people's plant. It, 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 everyone should benefit from it. It's a people's crop. And one of the reasons why I believe it went into hibernation, as I call it, mm -hmm. is because had it not have gone into hibernation, it might now be have been controlled by Monsanto or some yeah. of the big agri corps or some of the big agri um, companies. And actually, because it's been a bit of a, a rebel a rebel plant, um, it's still, I would say, it's the freest plant on the planet. It's the freest seed on the planet. And we need to keep it that free. Mm -hmm. And if any legislation that gets, um, gets changed, it needs to be so that farmers... And, and the domestic bio and regional economies can benefit from it and not big industries or big corporations um, taking it from the top down. It really needs to come from the bottom up. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point, actually, because you've wrote that perfectly here as well, but promoting rural yeah. entrepreneurship, stimulating rural industries and, and bridging the age, age gap, as we mentioned about the farmers. But that in particular is that... Um, Local economies will not continue to benefit unless the local people are in control of these situations, and unless they control the farms and the products that are getting produced. And Monsanto is, without a doubt, perhaps one of the biggest global threats towards any of that dynamic. Um, they're just an overarch overarching monopoly, which seems to be determined on grasping as much as they can and taking it all in. Um, whereas I sincerely hope that, like hemp, when it's been passed, that it will be um, counterintuitive to their monopoly strategy. Um, so the, the contribution you mentioned here the, to the bioeconomy for and a few of the, the, the um, products which can be um, used from hemp. So you've got bioplastics, hemp fiber can also be used either as reinforcing component for natural fiber composites um, or cellulose-based plastics such as natural insulation quilts and boards. Hempcrete, which is uh, extremely innovative. And that in itself, um, I was looking just for when I was looking over your, your, your work here, that there's a, there's a company um, that, uh, called Indie Block in Scotland in Lothian. And the guy had wrote, um, the, the CEO, um, on the article he was promoting, obviously, the benefit of hempcrete. And one of the things he mentioned was that the gas bill that he pays on a year from his house of hempcrete is £240 for the entire year. That in itself, when you look at that, I mean, a lot of people might be paying that like for every six weeks, that is unbelievable. And a lot of the time, if you say that to somebody, they might not, they might not even believe you because it sounds so out of fetch from what the, the big energy corporations are asking for you for gas every year. And that's because hemp dries all the way through. So it's a fantastic insulator. So it stays warm in, in winter and cold in summer, whereas concrete always remains wet inside. Right. So that's why you get a lot of damp and that's why it needs is a lot of and the insulation. And con concrete's really... It's, it's so environmentally um, uh, yeah. damaging yeah. and it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't really now knowing what we know, um, it doesn't, it, it doesn't really serve where we're going as a sustainable future. So moving to hempcrete really is a, is a no brainer. Yeah. And, um, and everyone feels so much happier in a hemp house because it's just so natural and it, you know, you're growing it. You can two, eight, two hectares of hemp can grow your house. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds so exciting. You have that, that connection to the land. I yeah, know. I think, how, be, how beautiful would that be? That you, yeah. you know, have two hectares, you grow your hemp, you turn it into, and then you can have all the boards and everything. Everything could be made from hemp, all the curtains, the carpets, yeah. the light shades, everything. And then you get the feeling of satisfaction that you did all this from scratch, you know, it's from the grassroots up, excuse the pun. That's, that's exactly you did it from the, like, from the ground, from the yeah. land, from Mother Earth. Yeah. Exactly. And exactly. It brings us back into connection to her. And the whole thing is, is that this disconnect from the land, is disconnect from nature, is disconnect from Mother Earth, and that, that we have everything we need. And we're just trashing it with um, yeah, profit and, you know, vested interests and no kind of real understanding of leaving a planet healthy for future generations. Yeah, yeah, just thinking about the next quarterly profit, essentially. Yeah, yeah, which is how our, which is how our financial system is set up. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, that is a, a completely different battle for another day, I think. <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, one of the benefits you've mentioned here, one of the examples given in the bioeconomy strategy of the bioeconomy at work is strong, lightweight materials, as you've mentioned, for the automotive and aerospace industries. You mentioned before Henry Ford. I think I've seen a video online where he has a hemp car and he has a, the, the, his other, I think it's um, not steel or whatever, the other car next to the metal car, and he like literally leathers both cars with a sledgehammer. I mean, this could be an act. I'm pretty certain I've seen this. And the hemp car is almost no damage. And the yeah, car is it just like off. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. It's like that in itself. You would think that that would just be take that and then every car is now made from hemp you would think so well they're starting to the automobile industry is almost is definitely uses hemp now in its in its um outer panels and and stuff like that but it's because of this ban it's because of this this controversy this politicalization of the plant i mean it's the only plant i mean in how 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 does a species politicize a plant like hemp or like cannabis that's so useful to human health and well-being and creates so many sustainable products and can really help us keep the planet back into balance i mean that's cannabis's cannabis's role as a plant is to bring things back into homeostasis yeah. the thc the whole the whole aim of thc is to bring things back into to homeostasis so why it's used in cancer is because it goes straight to the tumor and it brings those cells back into homeostasis that's its aim and its job mm -hmm. and right now we are so out of balance that we really need to be bringing back the environment and ourselves back into balance back into homeostasis and and hemp is the plant to do that mm -hmm. and uh, again the science is there it's all obvious but if you look at the home office and their rhetoric around it, they still believe that there's no evidence to show that they're still following that old, very old story. And I don't know, I'm not sure what it would take for that, that narrative to finally disintegrate. Uh, and I'm, we're hope, I'm hoping that this, with this hemp manifesto and we get enough support behind it, we could really basically just very clearly show the arguments and show that it's a no brainer and actually, that there's no, there, there's no, there's nothing you can really argue with that hemp manifesto. It's very clearly laid out that if you don't adopt a hemp, um, a, a hemp, uh, a, a, if you don't ignite a hemp industry and you don't um, reduce and, and roll back some of those le those legislative uh, barriers, then we're just going to be falling very far behind the rest of the world. Yeah, which is already painfully evident. Um, just by yeah, the, which is already painfully yeah. evident, exactly. It really is. Um, so another benefit you would have is the British Commonwealth. Um, the export of, um, market is outside the EU. Um, so the, the DTI has acknowledged and identified that they are key knowledge transfer that they are uh, that there are key knowledge transfer opportunities between the UK and more developed tent markets such as Canada. Um, the Commonwealth has been identified as a key target for UK growth trade missions, facilitating and encouraging cross-border collaborations that are essential to UK hemp, uh, UK hemp industry development. This would be tremendous if, uh, because essentially what you're writing here is um, this would be post change of legislation. Yes. Yeah. If yeah. you could change legislation, then suddenly, and, and we could start getting investment and start getting interest from you know the environment the agricultural community we could look towards canada that obviously that has a thriving hemp industry or look towards jamaica and look towards other you know commonwealth countries and that we could do cross-border collaborations with and actually grow the industry because there isn't that much land in the uk to really flourish in a way but if we had cross um, border collaborations with the commonwealth yeah. then we could definitely in increase the in the you know the great british uh, hemp yeah yeah um so the climate goals as we've already mentioned before um is extremely important and i think something that often goes um goes missed when it comes to growing hemp in particular because it's kind of so centralized in industry or economy or as we've mentioned narcotic based so the basis on on the environment itself is tremendous i mean and the, this continuously uh, the increasingly the increasing danger of climate change is is evident every single year so you've wrote here as well that the um the uh, the benefits um the papers for many of the solutions hemp can provide is improved soil water and air quality increased biodiversity climate change mitigation um minimized pesticide use and better use of crop rotation um each single one of these things as we mentioned like um the, the carbon sequestration phytoremediation and carbon neutral products are central to the paris agreement um, and, and hemp covers every single one of these grounds. As I struggle to think that there's another product, another plant that does the exact same. No, I don't think so. I mean, yeah. they've tried miscanthus, they've tried a number of different crops, but actually, hemp is is it surpasses all of them. Yeah, yeah, um, and and that's essentially 
you've concluded here with uh, essentially we need exact change straight away. And um, the manifesto proposes that the UK has a real opportunity to play a leading role in the development and expansion of this environmentally responsible industry. And um, frustratingly, it says it has a real opportunity. That window of opportunity seems to be drawn very close, like coming near to an end almost if we don't get our act together. Yeah, it's now. It's now in the next year or so. If we don't start making some changes now, then what we're going to see is that a lot of agreements happening with big corporations from America and from Canada, and we'll become, we'll become, um, we'll become uh, consumers of it, but we won't be have enough opportunity to really be able to be part of the, the, the global industry that's really flourishing right now in many different parts of the world. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, re I really hope that this is, is really going to take off, and I really hope your manifesto helps with this, Rebecca, because as you, I mean, you've wrote at you, the beginning as well that the supporters here, you've got Beyond Green in Northern Ireland Hemp, Unite Hemp, you've got the British Hemp Alliance, which obviously you're associated with, uh, Vitality Hemp, Big Chief Hemp. I have no doubt that um, if the village like, was there, the Scottish Hemp Association would be more than happy to associate themselves with this because this yeah. underpins absolutely everything. So, I mean, do you think, what, what is the next stage for, for yourself, I mean, um, and for the Hemp Manifesto? Are you just waiting around for December, essentially, and see what happens at the UN single convention? Oh, no, no, no. We're going to be, we're, we're going to, we're pitching, we got it to Michael Gove, so we were able to show it to him and spark his interest. And we're gaining more, um, more support now from different organizations. And the aim is to start a UK petition um, to start getting the debate going in Parliament and to um, see if we can get it to key MPs, start an APPG and um, start moving it in many in, in 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 lots of different ways. I mean, there's the, the difficulty is is because of the coronavirus. Yeah. Uh, politically, everything's a bit in the shambles. So the traditional way that you would set something up is it doesn't really um, doesn't really work so much so well anymore. Yeah. So it is also about negotiating and navigating this 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 time and seeing which is the easiest way to um, get it out into the mainstream and get it out into different um, into a different areas so people can actually see it and get read it there's just a lot of noise out there so it's yeah. people like yourself and doing podcasts and, and and having people much more aware that it that it exists and that there isn't this potential for hemp and the more people that can get behind it the more people that can sign up to the manifesto will um join us on it the the, the more of a voice we we have as a grassroots the, the problem is is that where the money is is where the power lies yeah. and so uh, grassroots movements don't really have a lot of say because they don't have the influence um, but if you have a, a, a strong amount of people then that that is its value is, is, is in that so it's about getting as many people on board now to back the manifesto in order to um, pressurize and show government that there's a there is a will from a, a public will to to make those changes the power really but we're still lie. we're still working through that. Well, sorry, the power really does lie within the people, like you mentioned, and the, the, I think that's where there's a misconception where we think that all oh, these people are uh, the, like corporate elites or, or individuals that are controlling society. They are the power hand, and the reality is, we vastly outnumber these individuals. We've kind of became dormant with the ability to instigate change, apart from inst instances such as you're creating. Um, so these, this is as you mentioned, that really does the power really does lie within the individuals. And um, if you like, I mean, I could uh, um, attach the link to your manifesto in the description box below. If you like, do you have it on the website? Oh yeah, is, is oh yeah, I have it on the website. So yeah. I'm managing director of the British Hemp Alliance, and so we're we're kind of promoting and and, and pushing this uh, manifesto. So if people go and visit the British Hemp Alliance, they'll see the manifestos there. And if they want to get involved and become a member of the British Hemp Alliance and help us. Um, promote this and, and get it out to as many people as possible that would be great and we we are the only at the moment um, organization that's looking at hemp as an environmental agricultural crop there's other organizations out there but most of them are looking at the cannabinoid yeah. um and this and the uh, cbd part of the 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 plant but really the british hemp alliance is it's about recognizing the hemp as an agricultural crop and, and really lobbying government. And we're a political lobbying group to lobby government in order to remove those restrictions that are stopping this hemp industry from flourishing. And um, one thing that I wanted to mention from what you said is that um, one of the reasons why I set up, uh, I set up um, with a few others, the British Hemp Alliance, is because um, I 
I was trained in the Amazon by a Peruvian Amazonian shaman many, many years ago, like 20 years ago, uh, over 20 years ago. And one of the indigenous beliefs is that we leave a planet healthy for future generations, at least seven generations down. Yeah. And it's a obligation for every human to be leaving this planet in a healthy state. And we are not leaving our planet in a healthy state. So um, hemp is a really viable solution to start cleaning up some of the mess that we're leaving for our future children. And for me, it's, uh, I feel it's a very important duty to um, do what I can in order to clean up and keep this planet healthy so that generations can flourish after us um, because what we're doing now we're not leaving this planet healthy for the next generation let alone seven okay. generations down and so a big clear up um, is real is really necessary and hemp is a viable is one of the very viable it's not the solution but it's definitely one of the solutions mm. and so removing those political barriers to growth now and really recognizing it and then enabling the industry to flourish um, from the grassroots could really help in that cleanup effort to leave um, this, this planet healthy and vibrant and flourishing yeah. for all biodiversity, not just for humans, but for when we're in the sixth biggest extinction, uh, we're, we're trashing this planet and it's, it's, it's a crime against the future generations that are coming. And so it's really important that we recognize our responsibility and do what we can in order to mitigate the chaos that um, we're leaving for them. Yeah, that's very well said, Rebecca. I'm in 100% agreement. Without a doubt. Thank uh, you. I, I, again, well done. This has been extremely timely to get this manifesto up and running. Oops. Uh, yeah, so it's like well done. It's it's hundred percent been necessary, and, and you've, you've, it's yeah. timely to say the least. Um, so thank you very much for chatting with Rebecca. Anything you'd like to add before we get going? Uh, well, thanks ever so much, Connor. Yeah, please do visit the British Hemp Alliance, and if you want to email me at Rebecca at BritishHempAlliance.co.uk if you have any questions. And yeah, please do become a member. It really helps us just um, to keep on going. We have individual and business memberships. It's like five pounds a month, so it's very reasonable. But the more people that join, the more people that get behind the manifesto, the more people that have their voices heard the quicker and easier we can hopefully remove some of these regulations or all of the recent regulations and are now a vibrant, flourishing industry, um, hemp industry here in the UK. Thank you, Rebecca. This has been brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Connor. Lovely to see you. Yeah. And thanks for um, offering to share this Hemp Manifesto with your uh, listeners. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rebecca, for giving me your time. And thanks to you for sticking around until the end of the video. I sincerely hope you enjoyed the content. I'll see you next time.